The reunion is privileged to be here. Last speaker so kindly reminded Estonian singers. Well, before these singers, as I am coming from Estonia, we had a period of Nazi and communist occupation, which costed to my nation uh, one-fifth of our population as a demographic loss, one-fifth, before the singing revolution. Mr. President uh, so kindly referred that these weapons we are giving to Ukrainians will make also in harm to civilians, as this is a uh, cruel rule of law, we know. But let me put to the, this perspective. If Putin ends the war and gives the order to his soldiers to end the conflict, the war is over. If Ukrainians will end the war, it will mean annihilation of Ukrainian nation and statehood. Intent what Putin has not made any secrets. The Russian peace for Ukrainians would mean a genocide. After Irpin and Bucha, I visited the places I spoke with victims, with investigators from Ukrainian side, with international lawyers, and I drafted a Estonian parliament resolution. It was a first world parliament resolution that this war is a genocidal war. And we made a call to all world parliaments to recognize it as a genocidal war. And you know, only 15 countries did it. President Macron, in last April, very wisely in his context, stated, we can't do it. Because then, if we recognize it as a genocidal type of war, we need to act more under the Convention Against Genocide. And it means escalation. And I do not, referring to him, if it, this is something we want. If something is hypocrisy, I would say this is hypocrisy. So there are three arguments for the actions against dictators, against totalitarianism. The first, as I mentioned, is a humanitarian one, to end human sufferings, to end genocide, to end the crimes against humanity, because we can't get these li people's lives back. And we have seen, if, if we are speaking all these conflicts, if we are speaking about the Ukrainian war, how it has spread and caused a mass of human sufferings. Second argument is a security argument, a rules-based world argument. An archipelago of democracies in a global perspective is diminishing. Our share in the world and our world uh, understanding, uh, if we're looking uh, militarily, economically, demographically, it's diminishing. And it means that we stand for the rules-based world order. If we accept that the borders of countries could be chosen and changed by the power of tanks, it means that we will face the future of our children and grandchildren as an eternal war and suppression. And the third argument is a moral one. It's about us. If we look at the Ukrainian war to the mirror, we, Western people, will we feel shame or not? Were we the generation, as was earlier referred, of Churchill or Chamberlain? The one thing is truly that our actions should be based on the international law basics and principles. It's clear, evident. Secondly, that we should understand, do we have the might to act? And the mo as, uh, it is a moral cowardice. If we do have a might, but we do not act. And the example of uh, appeasement is a Russian aggression war of, against Ukraine. And I will stay very clear that if the West has been more determined in the willpower, in the actions, this 
war could be avoided. During the siege of Kiev, I was together in Kiev with President Zelensky, and he said, you, you need to act because it is your moral obligation, your moral burden. After the Georgian war, you know, there was zero sanctions against Russia. After the 2014 war and uh, annexation of Crimea, there were minor sanctions and Russian economy got used with that. And President Poroshenko, September 14, went to US Congress and asked for weapons. And President Obama gave a check to $50 million and said, we are send, going to send blankets to Ukrainian soldiers. Poroshenko told to Congress, nobody fights for their homeland with blankets. So the case is that vice versa. We haven't done enough for freedom, for ending the genocide, if we're speaking, resisting Putin. Looking uh, the economic sanctions, well, IMF is for the, this year making a prognosis that Russian economy is making a rise, 0.3%. And last year, economic loss to Russian economy was 2%. And the Ukrainian economic loss was 30%. Russia, in, during the last year, got historical net profit from the oil and gas business. 28% more than before the fall of the last stage of war. You know, there are 13 Russian banks deswifted from the swift operational banking system. And you know how many Russian banks there are together as financial uh, international institutions? More than 300, it's a joke. So we haven't used our might as an economic power against Russia. What about weapon aid? Germany gave three more uh, per, per, per capita for, uh, in relation to GDP, military aid to uh, in a Kuwait operation, when they have done during the year. US, two times more to Kuwait operation. And looking to the perspective that there is a false myth that our uh, uh, shelves are out of uh, weapons, this is untrue. There are, we have given around 5% all combined together of our LMRS, of our tanks, of our howitzers. Only 5%. And it's comparing to Russian military might about 10% what Russians do have. So in a basis of military aid, let's put it to the European Union perspective. European Union during the year, all the help to Ukraine is less than 10% when European governments during the last year gave to the citizens to ease the energy burden of the households and companies. So these are the perspectives, if we look. So my basis is that appeasement and cowardice and economic interests have encouraged the beast, have encouraged the aggressor, and this conflict has turned to a war, now this is a regional war, a war which actually is not a world war, but a war of world, where all the world countries are in a way or another involved or influenced. And our view is that if you sleep eyes wide shut and believe that things will turn down by themselves. The time is working against you. The time is currently working against Ukrainian people who have lost their lives, who are currently under fire. And we need to change the paradigm. 
the paradigm that we need to invest as much as it needed to losing of Russia and the victory of Ukraine. Because first, it is the argument of, from the humanistic perspective and Ukraine is now having a freedom fight on the very clear international law, UN Charter Article 55, basis of self-defense of independent country. Secondly, it is a security argument. If we can imagine anyhow that the outcome of this war will be ambivalent or somehow even interpreted as a Putin's victory, it means eternal security chaos all over Europe. And the new dictators, the new aggressors and oppressors are looking with the greatest interest, also the president, what history is now made by us, either our activity or our passivity. And thirdly, there is a moral argument, who we are, for what we stand. Are we worth of these values? We are very proud in a warm halls to speak. Are we capable morally to accept that our leaders will make phone calls to a person who commits genocide, to a modern Hitler, or this person, Putin, belongs on the tribunal as a war criminal. And it's very sad to say that G7 leaders have secretly followed a pact that they will not create such kind of tribunal, in a while at least. So it's a question who we are. Thank you.